Welcome to The Microscopists, a bite-sized bio podcast, hosted by Peter O'Toole, sponsored by Zeiss Microscopy. Today on The Microscopists. Today on The Microscopists, I'm joined by Dave Piston, Professor and Head of Cell Biology and Physiology at the Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. Dave uses innovative imaging and biochemical methods to identify new therapeutic targets for diabetes, but microscopy and biology were definitely not where he started out. Yeah, as ultrafast laser physics was sort of where I was, that's, that was my first love. That was until his early passion in physics became much less interesting to him. In fact, I think I probably wanted to do that up until the time I was in graduate school and realized you had to take two years of quantum mechanics. Okay. I took a year of quantum mechanics and I somehow got an A in the course, but I didn't understand a lick of it. And we discussed his recent exploits in Singapore, where he was able to combine his love for travel and science. It's, uh, I like going over there. It's, it's um, you know, you don't, it's 12 hours time difference, so you don't get jet lag. It's just complete sleep deprivation. And we hear about the role Serendipity has played in his career so far. Right place, right time, I guess. I started doing that and I realized there's a lot of uh, interesting biology that can be done once you have the ability to do side-directed mutants. All in this episode of The Microscopist. Hi, I'm Peter O'Toole from the University of York, and today I'm joined by Dave Piston from the Washington School of Medicine. Dave, how are you today? Doing great. God, that's the hardest bit done. Uh, <laughs> Dave, I've, I've known of you for many, many years, from my PhD days, uh, but I met you, I think, oh gosh, I can't remember if it was in Ghent or if it was in Munich or Heidelberg, somewhere. I think it was in Munich. Now, so that was a... I think a, a workshop on correlated microscopy and workflows. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but interestingly, I know you for your, your bio, from my side, I'd say more biochemistry, biophysics side, but your background is in physics. Is that correct? Yeah. As ultra fast laser physics was sort of where I was. That's, that was my first love. So, so what happened to your first love? If it's not any more, who's your second love then? If you've got a first love of ultra fast lasers, <laughs> Well, I mean, uh, so I was you know, working in ultrafast lasers and doing spectroscopy. And uh, at the time when I was uh, sort of in graduate school it was sort of the end of the Cold War and uh, funding for a lot of solid state physics, uh, especially mesoscopic and, and um, single towards single molecule type of solid state physics uh, was had not really developed, was drying up because a lot of it had been defense related uh, funding, I think. And uh, and so. Um, also, there was just sort of a dearth of new interesting problems. High, super, high TC superconductivity hadn't come around yet. Um, a lot of the interesting mesoscopic things like uh, uh, graphene and different uh, uh, special um, materials sort of hadn't, hadn't really been developed. And uh, when I was working, it was, um, I was in graduate school, I was TAing for a guy named Enrico Graton, who ended up being my PhD advisor. And he was, using uh, laser spectroscopy, but putting biomolecules in the QVAT rather than solid state stuff. And he needed somebody that could run the lasers and uh, develop some new um, ultra high frequency um, parallel uh, harmonic content uh, analysis tools. And these are the sort of things I like doing. So uh, he had money at the time and I joined his lab and, and I started doing, uh, you know, sort of getting a little bit into biophysics that way. And then, um, you know, I. I sort of had decided I wanted to learn something about imaging, and uh, because it was it was the idea of doing parallel spectroscopy, where you know, instead of doing just one spot of spectroscopy, you can do uh, do everything in sort of in parallel. And I thought, well, you could do imaging really fast, and with sort of things like confocal, you could start doing things like fluorescence correlation spectroscopy. A lot of um, very interesting analysis um, techniques that you could use then. And, and so I went to Watt Webb's lab at Cornell and. As I showed up there it was just when two photon was invented uh, by Winfred Dank and Jim Strickler and, and Webb. And um, they needed somebody that knew something about ultra fast lasers, uh, femtosecond lasers to push the two photon technology forward. <clears throat> so uh, right place, right time, I guess. I started doing that and I realized there's a lot of uh, interesting biology that can be done once you have the ability to do site-directed mutants. 
So, so, I, so I directed mutagenesis of proteins was invented while I was in graduate school. And so it was sort of new and you then could, could take an enzyme and you could make different mutations to it. And you could say, make it less active, more active, a little more active, inactive. Then you could get an axis and you could plot data. And if you can have an axis and plot data, physicists can try to figure it out. So, um, so I started, I'd go down that road and um, I just slowly and surely went more and more biological um, mainly because that's where the, where my interests lay. I mean, I, there were interesting problems to work on and we started pursuing them. And, um, now I think I'm not much of a physicist anymore. Now my, my second love is, uh, pancreatic island. <laughs> so I, I think that that's a really enlightening sort of track. You know, you, you've gone from kind of a hardcore physicist now into a, a hardcore physiologist, biologist, biochemist, uh, biophysicist, whichever way you want to word it, uh, through that. At the age of 10, where did you, so, so as a young child, where, what, what did you see your future career to be? When I was 10, well, it's, I, I don't know if you read this someplace, when I was 10, I made my first telescope. Really? Uh, at that time, yeah, I ground a six inch uh, reflecting, Newtonian reflector mirror. Uh, the local, local uh, amateur astronomy group had this uh, grind your own, build your own telescope workshop. And I went and ground my own mirror and uh, built a telescope out of a eight inch tube and a little wooden mount and uh, a few parts that you had to buy from Edmund Scientific uh, and, uh, <clears throat> and built that. And I thought, I always thought I would be an astrophysicist. I thought that was, that's really what I wanted to do. Uh, in fact, I think I probably wanted to do that up until the time I was in graduate school and realized you had to take two years of quantum mechanics. And, uh, <laughs> I took, I took a year of quantum mechanics and I somehow got an A in the course, but I didn't understand a lick of it. I mean, I, I know how to do the problems. I'm a good enough mathematician to do the problems. And I, I kind of get the concept that I like things that I have some intuition about them, right? I, can, I, can, I like things where you can do something to say, here's a simple version, is my theory right? And in quantum mechanics, it's, there's no such thing. So so, so, so you, I guess that's where your pa passion triggered off. You got into physics. You realized that astrophysics wasn't for you. Yeah. So at that age, where did you see yourself going? Because it certainly wasn't in the bio if it was hard. If it was oh, no, it wasn't in the bio. I was really, really, in, I, I was, I really wanted to do, um, I was really interested in maybe doing single molecule. What, what does a single molecule look like at a, uh, in a, in a transistor? Um, the idea being that uh, when you have transistors, you know, a lot of the, the PN junction, a lot of the theory is, is bulk, but they're making these things smaller and smaller and smaller so that you have a hundred charge carriers or, or fewer. And when you, when you get to that level, now you're no longer, you're really not in a statistical regime anymore. You start to get into more of a single molecule regime. So trying to look at exciton hole recombination or uh, those sort of things right at a, at, a, at a material junction where you can get to sort of single events. And then, you know, is it possible to build a transistor that would be, I guess, in a sense, be like a quantum transistor in a sense. Now, when they're talking about quantum computing, where, where you're really looking at single, single quantile events uh, to store data or to, to process data. So I sort of wanted to do that, but uh, the labs that were doing that sort of spectroscopy didn't, they were having trouble fund, getting funding. Um, they, the, the students there had to TA a lot. Um, and so it seemed, seemed to me, I, I, I liked working in the lab. I'm, I'm sort of a, for a better term, lab rat. You know, I, I, liked, I liked going and turning the lights out and, and giving a Allen wrench in one hand and a mirror adjustment in the other hand and building my own lasers and these sort of things. That's what I like doing, so. Tell me you're not still doing that. Um, it doesn't, I have a microscope back here. Uh, uh, I see. But no, I, I uh, I, I, they don't let me pass that door. My lab is through that door back there and they, they usually don't like me to come back there. Uh, every once in a while I'll go, I'll go help, uh, you know, put together a, a new floating table, uh, you know, optical table and get the floating balanced uh, of the legs or something like that. But the lasers now, um, <clears throat> lasers we buy now are completely sealed cavities and they don't, there's no user serviceable parts. They, they dial into it by the internet and if they can't fix it, they send you a new one and they, to come and put that on the table and take your old one and put it in the box and send it back. <clears throat> I'll tell you a story when uh, Coherent had the first sealed cavity tie sapphire 
um, we had one and it wasn't working. And I thought, well, let's just take the top off and see if there's anything we can do. And I think there was something on the order of 320 Allen wrench, uh, Allen screws on it. And, and I was looking at this, I said, 320, I don't think I can undo all those before their service guy is going to show up. When I, talked to, when I talked to the designers, they said, yeah, I'm sure there was a meeting someplace where, where they said, how many, how many screws do we have to put on before Piston will try to open it? You know, they so I said 50. Oh, no, no, he'll open 50. So they got to 320 or something. They said, yeah, that's probably enough. It, <laughs> it worked. worked. Yeah. It so uh, no, I, haven't, uh, I, I, haven't, uh, I haven't worked in my own lab in a long time. I've taken a couple of sabbaticals um and uh, have worked in the lab over the summers um in 2011 at woods hole and then in 2019 in uh, at a store in singapore oh so, so you sent me a picture of oh, yeah that's me that's, lab. Me that's me i'm mixing up a buffer i know i look really like i'm really professional there but I, all i'm doing is making up making up a buffer from my experiments but i did some did some experiments with uh looking at actin and calcium actin uh, polymerization and calcium in the in beta cells and alpha cells I uh, got some preliminary data for a grant that we've since gotten funded, and I have a, a postdoc now that's working on that project, taking it forward. So, I, I think the scariest thing is is the thought of a physicist with a with a Eppendorf Gilson pipetting in their hand. Yeah. Well, I look like I know what I'm doing, don't I? Uh, it looks very convincing. Yeah. Well, I'm sure politicians do that when they go into <laughs> science labs. I, I was just making up a buffer. I think I think somebody else had to take out of my hand the pH at folks. I couldn't get the pH meter to work in their lab. <laughs> so, so how long were you over in A star for? So we were the we, I was there I was in the lab for eight weeks. Um, <clears throat> how, do you, how do you enjoy A star in Singapore? Oh, I like I like uh, I like going there a lot. It's um uh, I've been there quite a bit. Um, I started to go in there as a collaborator for Britain Chance about uh, 12, 13 years ago. I guess I've been working with Wei Peng Han there in the in the imaging uh, imaging consortium. Um, it's uh, I like going over there. It's it's um, you know you don't it's twelve hours time difference, so you don't get jet lag. It's just complete sleep deprivation. <laughs> um, uh, but they have a lot, large group that works on islets and uh, and also does cancer stuff. And so they do a lot of high end imaging um, in the areas where that I work, and so it's um, it's good. It's a place to it, you know, it's um, it's a, as a as a you know, so a national lab. It, it just people there are working, and they they have equipment that works, and it's um, there's nothing bubble gummed and you know together. Uh, so it's a place you can go and just just. Uh, I had a little office, a little bench, and uh, a microscope, and that's all I need. That sounds cool. <laughs> I think, I'm thinking about that side so obviously we've talked about how your career's progressed through to it but you're also head of the department for yeah. cell biology and physiology which again is a very different job description compared to running your own lab when you yeah. start to become head of a department so what have been the biggest challenges for you in that in the in the role of head of the department yeah so um, i guess the, the biggest challenge is is the biggest challenge is always communicating with people and keeping them on the you know, keeping them on the same track and keeping them knowing what you're doing. Uh, if you start doing things, it gets people together and they say, yeah, let's do this. And then you start doing it. If you don't report back to them, then they think you aren't doing it or they think you're doing it wrong, uh, even if you are doing what they want. So um, that's uh, probably against my nature a little bit. I just, yeah, we had this agreement. Now I'm doing my part. I'm going to, I'll report when I'm done. Um, so that's, that's sort of been, um, for me, particularly uh, a tougher part of it. Um, I think that uh, obviously um, managing the department through COVID has been a tough part. Uh, and then the communication was even more important, but the communication was so important then that it had to be done. Yeah. Right. I mean, I was the, I was the lifeline for all the communication from the, from the uh, administration about what was allowed, what wasn't allowed, how we could keep things going. So it really forced me to communicate. That's that was my full time job. Really, was just communicating up and back and, and side to side, peer to peer, um, with the dean's office to my faculty, with my other chair colleagues across the campus, from the medical school to the uh, arts and science and the engineering campuses uh, that were struggling with the same sort of thing. So, um, you know, I think that that taught me a lot about how to be more efficient with that. 
Um, but that's certainly, you know, that's not something that I'm, I'm good at signing things and, and doing the budget and things like that. I it just, I've always sort of had a knack for, for budgets and numbers. And uh, so that was, that's just something a lot of chairs really struggle with. And for me, that wasn't hard. Uh, but there's a lot of people that are much more natural communicators and keep people up to date with what they're doing all the time. And that's not my natural style. So um, that was, that's, that's been the hardest, that's the hardest thing, right? People, people don't that. trust, people don't trust you. It's like, why wouldn't you trust me? I'm the most trustworthy guy there is, but you know, until they've seen it over and over and over, they don't, they don't know. So. Yeah. And people, you, you always get new people as yeah. well. So, so that, that, that knowledge goes. Yeah. You know, no, that's right. Fresh faces. And, and you're right. Why, you know, why would they know that at the start? Yeah. So what, what would you say your management style is? Well, I mean, uh, in general, it's, I'm very hands-off. I'm very laissez-faire. I mean, I try to hire people that are good and get out of their way. Um, you know, if, if I've hired people that aren't good, I've had to work pretty hard to, to um, convince them that they need to be someplace else. I cannot, <laughs> I'm not going to be able, not gonna be able to micromanage them and uh, help them all the time. How hard a gig is that though? When they're, when they're underperforming, how do you get them to try and either perform and can you ever get them to perform ultimately? Um, yeah. Um, no, generally I control their salaries and people don't like pay cuts. Oh, that, that, that must be a hard gig as well, saying, sorry, X, but you've, uh, you know, well, I mean, you, you, you have cut. to document, you have to document it. Um, and we have enough, enough management things in place where with the staff, there have to be annual evaluations. And we have good support from HR for, um, you know, for helping people with performance improvement, counseling, and, and whatnot. Um, now that's you know for the professional staff for the for the hourly workers. You know, my lab. Uh, you know, in my lab, I've had several people that uh, have come in that have ended up with master's degrees. Uh, I think they were every bit capable of doing a PhD. Um, I think they needed a person that was going to be a lot more hands-on to, to help them. Uh, in fact, one, one case, we got the person into another PhD program. He actually was just in the wrong PhD program for him. Yeah. So went back to more material science, uh, finished, uh, did, is doing great. Um, and so I think, you know, I'm pretty, I'm pretty open with people when they come to my lab, this is how I am. And this is, I expect you to be fully self-motivated. Um, and I will, my job is to help you succeed your job is to succeed, right? I mean, I, I, I can't do that for you. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, full credit. I think it's a really difficult gig because uh, I can imagine you will take the department in a direction and not everyone will want to go in that direction necessarily. And, and yeah. you know, the, we're talking very senior staff in, in yeah. some of these cases. So how do you get them to follow or do you just go, well, that's the way it is? Well, that's the way it is. I mean, it's uh, at some point, that's the way it is. Yeah, it's... Um... Yeah, I mean, it, there's people that want to change things. There's people that want more support and more. Uh, they think, oh, we should, you should be doing more of this or more of that. I said, well, that's not. You know, we we talk as a faculty. We we had our five year department review. Uh, it was actually at six years because it was supposed to happen right before COVID. You know, right as COVID was starting, got delayed, uh, and we've had a sort of a. Um, you know, some external external uh, visitors come and see the department and, and interview everybody. And we've sat down as a faculty and made some uh, strategic plans. They're not really so strategic as much as they're um, organizational and tactical, but uh, ideas what we want to do. And uh, I've, I've let the faculty lead a lot of those um, different uh, different things. And some of them go better than others. And and uh, I think they realize how much work it is to actually make some of these things come, come to, to fruition. So, so, so we've, we've gone right through the cycle of wanting to be an astrophysicist, realizing that wasn't for you to become a physicist, to realizing the opportunities were maybe more limited by the single particle materials and moving into the life sciences to quite, a, which you've still kept, obviously, but also taken on this other responsibility. Give it another 10 years. What would your ideal job be? If you could do any uh, job in the world, what would it be? Well, so I don't know what I, I don't know what it's going to be like then, but I tell you, if I was retiring, so I, I, I plan to close my lab 
in about 10 to 12 years. Um, a, I think science is a young person's game. And I think that um, there's too many people that are uh, over 65 that have huge amounts of NIH funding, which is why young people can't get started uh, very easily. So, um, but um, I, mean, I don't plan on, I, I close my lab and I'll retire from doing active science, but I, I guess I have an idea of writing, uh, maybe writing a textbook or two um, if there's still a need for them. There really is a need right now for, for a serious microscopy book that would be um, a little, kind of like the, 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 predis, the successor of the video microscopy book of Shin Yin Yue. Uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of stuff in there that's really very, very valuable, but there's a lot of things now with how we do analysis and how things are totally digital, seamless, um, that really needs to be integrated into that. So that would be something I might want to do. Um, and then the other thing I want to do is write web pages for nonprofits. Because I there's like a, some nonprofit or agency that I hear of and I want to give them some money and I go to their web page, I can't figure out how to donate. And uh, I'm not going to pick up a checkbook and write a check and stick it in the envelope. I just don't. I, a, I don't know if I have an envelope. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, I think that I want these people to join the 21st century. So there's there's a couple of companies that have started, you know, hosting a lot of nonprofits and giving tools. But those those poor company, you know, those those people are out there helping helping homeless people and helping hungry people, and they need to be out doing that, not writing web pages. So um, I think I'd like to do something like that for a second career. That's that's a pretty cool. And mainly just to get career. mainly to get my programming skills back because. You know, my I taught my daughter's uh, um, Java programming, so and uh, so I was realizing how much I missed doing that sort of stuff. So uh, to go through, obviously, there's been quite stressful times in the lab. What do you do outside of the lab to chill out? Oh, uh, so uh, so I, I mean, now I have a couple of girls in high school, so that's most of what I do is try to figure out where they are. Um, whether whether they need a ride or a car or something my older daughter's driving now so is this your family us, oh this is that's what I, that's my family yeah that's just, okay yeah so when we went to so the reason one of the reasons to go to singapore and a star was that uh, i wanted to get my family out of the country and uh and my daughters at that time i think were probably 12 and 12 and 10 um something like that 13 and 13 and 11 and uh, so Singapore, they speak English, right? So, and all the signs are in English, even if they, people speak Chinese or, or Indian or uh, Malay, um, all the signs are in English and you can, you can get around in English. Uh, and so we, we got a chance to go to Angkor Wat. This is us at, at Angkor Wat, which was one of my bucket list uh, places. That's my wife there in the pink on the, on the, on the right, I guess. Yep. Uh, and, uh, and obviously the old bald guys me. Um, and my older daughter Casey is on the right, and then uh, Elena is the younger one is on the left. So we had we had a blast in, in uh, at Anchor Watt and that. Um, so that's that's uh, yeah we I, I, we like to travel. I like to travel. Uh, we don't we don't get to travel as much as we used to. We go to Florida for a couple of weeks for vacation and go to the beach. Um, and uh, the girls are both having friends down uh, this year to, to stay in the house with us. So uh, we'll see. How, we'll see how that goes. Are they following in your footsteps with the way of physics or life science? Uh, no, or? not at all. I think uh, as far as possible. Uh, my my older daughter is much more of a English. I think English. I think she probably wants to do writing. Although she's thinking about maybe being a doctor now. So I think that has more to do with her friend's mom as a pediatrician than and uh, anything else but she's thinking about maybe doing pre-med so uh, uh the younger one is she's very she's very into math and science but i don't think she wants to be a professional scientist at all i don't know if she's thought much about which she, she she's really into writing she does a lot of creative writing and writes stories and doing a lot of reading so <laughs> i was just thinking the irony of uh, a scientist who's got creative writing is quite yeah. a dangerous recipe. Yes, that's right. Well, hopefully we don't have very much creative writing in my in my in my business. <laughs> See over that. We I, read we read a little bit of it when we're reviewing articles occasionally. <laughs> you you sent a, a picture of a 
of this as well. It looks oh, like yeah. me, but no, you you caught. Yeah, that's a that's a thirty six pound striped bass I caught off of Woods Hole. Uh, so that's the other thing is that um, so this is actually represents my teaching. So you know, for many years I taught at Woods Hole uh, and uh, at uh, Mount Desert Biological Lab in the microscopy courses. I taught both AQLM and uh, and the uh, OMIBS at Woods Hole, and then uh, the spring and fall courses. And then I taught uh, with Simon Watkins this course we started up in uh, in Maine at, at the MDIBL for, for 20 years. I figured 20 years was long enough for, for me to do it. But this is, yeah, we went out, we went out early in the morning, this little small open boat in uh, October. It was miserable weather. But uh, as my friends say, if it's not miserable weather, you're never going to catch something like this. For, for anyone who's not familiar with Woods Home courses, go on, give a quick description. Uh, so, uh, so the Marine Biological Lab at Woods Hole is uh, one of the old marine labs. If you're in England, you know the MBA probably in, in Plymouth. Uh, it's it's pretty much patterned after the MBA in Plymouth. Uh, and it was another place where they got squids and the squid giant axon uh, were there and people came from all over the world to do patch recordings on them there when they were running. Uh, a lot of embryology that was done with sea urchins and uh, sea stars and other things. Uh, this is day and age before FedEx. You couldn't get things sent to your lab. You had to go to, to where the uh, to where the samples were. Um, and Woods Hole has this huge summer program where they teach a physiology course and a neurobiology course that are uh, sort of world famous. Uh, but they also have these uh, specialized courses, and they have the microscopy course. It's uh, been, a, been a big microscopy place over the years. Bob Allen and and Shane Yinue. I both taught courses there and Shinya was there for many, many years, uh, sort of the head of the imaging. And so uh, it's like 20, 30 people come and it's uh, 10 days or eight days or I'm not sure how, it used to be 10 days, I think it's down to like eight days now of, uh, of science camp. And you basically start at eight in the morning and go till 10 at night and uh, lectures in the morning and the labs in the afternoon, lecture, sort of the lectures late afternoon and then labs again in the evening. And, and then uh, eventually you go home and sleep some more. Dave, thinking about Inoue's book, the, the, the video microscopy, was yeah. video microscopy, wasn't it? Was it video microscopy? Yeah, it? video microscopy. I, which, which was kind of a Bible and it was one of a kind. You said, you know, when you were telling, maybe writing or updating or a similar book. Do you think that in today's age, not, not textually, not, not as hardback, but do you think that, do you think the field has now got so big? Oh yeah. It, it certainly wouldn't be encyclopedic the way it was when it was first written. But even the second version of it that he did with Ken Spring, uh, the second edition, uh, was not as encyclopedic. It had more at the end of quantitative stuff. But I think what, what, what is not is really quantitation, right? So what we, what we do now is we don't take pictures anymore. We're taking data. If you're, if you're using a confocal or a, or, a, or a CCD or a CMOS camera, you're yeah. taking data. Now, you might not be taking data because you're not paying attention, and you're, so you're just taking pictures, but you have the capability of taking data with very, little, with very little extra work. But you have to understand what you're doing, and you have to understand. And so, so just setting up a microscope to be quantitative, I think, is, is what you would want to do, and then talk about how, how to care for that data to not screw it up. I mean, basically what comes out of the microscope is the best you can ever get, right? You can only make it worse after that, right? What comes out of the objective lens is the best you can get and everything else just makes it worse. So the trick is to talk about how to make it as little worse as possible. Uh, and so I think that it really is more about how to do microscopy in a way that teaches people how to do microscopy, not every kind of microscopy you could ever do. And there's a lot of books that have that, right? There's a light sheet book about all these different ways to do light sheet. And, and there was a light sheet conference that we, um, Abhishek Kamir and uh, Gary Levsky just had at Woods Hole. I was back at Woods Hole for the first time since I, well, not since I caught that fish, but for, for 10 years this year. And uh, not much changes on Cape Cod, I'll tell you that. But uh, um, Anyway, it was, you know, there was a guy who gave, I don't remember who it was, but they gave a talk and they had all of the abbreviations they'd found in the literature. It filled up a whole slide of abbreviations for light sheet microscopy, different things, right? And so you don't want to be that way. I mean, the point is light sheet, it gives you a way to take data that is 
three-dimensionally resolved. So does confocal, right? So does turf. Uh, to me, turf, confocal, and light sheet are all identical, right? There's a little bit about there's a little bit about what the spread is and the thickness and these things, but those are all subtleties, right? I mean, that's the data comes out in some sort of you get some sort of line of data that has some signal to background, that has some signal to noise, and you can deal with that, right? And those are the same, right? It, what comes out of an image is the same. Um, and so what resolution is within that is something that can be well-defined. But people think of resolution as being, uh, oh, the, the light sheet's two microns thick, but that's not your resolution, right? And the number of times I read that resolution is different in confocal than in wide field, uh, which is just not true most of the time. If people use a one area unit pinhole or bigger, the resolution's the same. The dis three D discrimination is much much different. Yeah, because it's the add focus, uh, so you but, can achieve. Yeah, but resolution means something, right? You can't just so I, I think just teaching people that these words mean something and what they mean and why why they mean that and and what that means for what information you can gather in your image initially and keep in your image as you're processing it through is important. So thinking about imaging data, I and mean, imaging data is big. You know, it, it is by definition. Yes. Big data, uh, and depending on which modality you use, the data size is yeah. proportional to it. How do you see not just getting quantitative and preserving the data? How do you see the complexity of data analysis and getting the most out of that data moving in the in the future? Yeah, so this is one thing that we've been talking about. We have a grant from the Beckman Foundation on light sheet microscopy, which is mainly to figure out these sort of things, and so. <clears throat> Uh, there's obviously things you can do with compression, with uh, lossless compression, but none of that really gets you very far. We have our we have a dual view light sheet with big cameras we're doing using for spec, hyperspectral imaging, and uh, with that we can do about I think it's 2.8 gigabytes a second, and so we can easily do uh, 10 terabytes in a single experiment. Uh, there's no way. It, it, I mean, you just can't do anything other than take that 10 terabyte disk and hold it in your hand and move it around to places, right? The internet isn't fast enough, nor will it ever, nor will it be fast enough. <clears throat> but what we, what we have is we have a lot of data that is useless in there, right? We might be finding, we might be tracking particles. We might be tracking cells, but we have all the area around our cells yeah. in black. We have all the area of the cells that aren't there. So, we need to figure out ways to reduce those data sets only to the cell we're looking at uh, in real time. Because uh, just, you know, you might want to keep those 10 ter terabyte disks around forever, but you're never going to be able to analyze it, get it, move it around and deal with it. Uh, even using things like um, highly efficient programming languages like Julia that uh, are all real time and they don't load everything into RAM and they, they do memory swapping without you knowing it. And, allow you to, to work in apparently in real time on big data sets. But you know, 10 terabytes is still too big of a data set. And so you want to do things that are correlations across time and correlations across space, but you need to just throw away all the data that isn't there, right? So if you're if you have 16 bits every place you have or 32 bits every place you have dark, black, you know, sure there's some fluctuations there, but you don't care. It's not inside the cell. Uh, so so we have, you know, there's a lot of things you can do that just shrink the data set into 20% just easily, just by throwing away data you don't have uh, that isn't data uh, and mapping things. And so there's a lot of idea about doing holographic maps. Yep. So you, can, you can reduce things to holographic maps into lossless data sets that keep all the information and they keep the information in really deep, uh, you know, really deep bit numbers uh, that reflect larger data sets. Uh, and so th those sort of things I think we're gonna have to do in order to move forward with this. Right? So if we can take that 10, 10 terabytes and shrink it down into a couple hundred megabytes, a couple hundred gigabytes, well, then we can move it around on the internet that we have now. We can process it on the GPU clusters that we have sitting on our desk and we can start to visualize it. We need to visualize it in real time. I mean. Machine learning can visualize it in real time and track particles and do what, but we still have to look at it ourselves and see things that we aren't even asking the machine to see. Yeah, no, no absolutely. Would you say, I, I'm just thinking now, going back to when I started imaging with a liquid nitrogen chilled 
CCD camera, which I'm sure you remember those days and pouring it and chilling it. And yeah, it, it, the, the file sizes were minimal, but massive compared to what we had. <clears throat> Do you think it's now more difficult to get into microscopy than it was back 20 years ago or so? I think it's more complicated. I, I, I don't know the answer. No, it's actually it's much easier, I think. I mean, I think you can buy a, you can buy a high end for one hundred thousand dollars. You can buy a pretty high end microscope. And uh, and you can have high enough, high enough end stuff to really get yourself in trouble. Uh, I mean, you can you can cap, capture all kinds of things. And I mean, I, I see people are basically just capturing noise. They're so sensitive. Right. And they're just capturing noise and they're just amplifying the heck out of it. Um, and so maybe that's more the point. Maybe it's maybe we I, I, we were never asking simple questions. You know, we yeah. were pushing the limits of where it could go, but maybe we couldn't get into so much trouble because it wasn't turnkey. It wasn't you turnkey. Right? So the only people that went there were people that knew, you had to know what you were doing to to do it. You had to invest the time, right? If you were going to invest the time, it's like electron microscopy in the old days when you had to line the column yourself and do everything. I mean, there was nobody that couldn't look at an EM instantly and know whether it was good or not. You know, look, just look at the one picture and say, oh, this, this sample is no good. It's like, how can you, you know, how can you tell? It's like, they just knew, right? Um, I mean, I can go in and say, oh, this is out of focus. I couldn't even tell you which direction is out of focus. And the person's like, I couldn't figure, get it in focus. Like, well, you, you're going the wrong way. Uh, well, how do you know that? It's how it looks you know, when, you see, when you see it broken enough times you learn this right but now they're not right they, they have like perfect focus and they auto focus themselves and the one time they don't you don't know what to do right I don't actually one meeting this week had a data set and we looked at it uh, then then the bombardment question said this image just doesn't look right <laughs> whatever's gone wrong something's gone wrong somewhere it doesn't yeah. look right and so you analyze the microscope and then they said no it can't be the microscope because look at my previous image on five minutes before it, which was good. Yeah. Oh, so what's happened with the sample then? It's got to be, that it's just, yeah, it's just that level of engagement. And I think if you're right, you're generating lots of data and their images, but people need to look at both. They yeah. need to get the data. Well, and then they don't, they, 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 yeah. yeah, so they, they take their cells and they, or whatever, they've made a transgenic animal with a GFP in it. And they, they bring it down to the to the microscope core and they pay $50 an hour to use some sort of high-end microscope and everything. And then they go back and they try to analyze it on their on their laptop with no memory and no no computing power. Yes. And they, they want to invest in that. I'm going to fit out of work for a minute. We'll come back to it because I've got some key questions I really want, I want to get a feel for. But I'm going to ask some quick fire questions first. So PC or Mac? Uh, PC. Not, not, not anything. It's just that all the instruments are controlled by PCs, and it's yeah. McDonald's or Burger King. Neither. Oh, so what's your takeaway choice? Uh, I cook at home if that's if I have to do something like ah. that. so would you prefer to cook or wash up? Oh, I uh, both actually. I, I do both all. Of... I, I I I cook. I do all the cooking at home. And uh, and I wash the pans because I can't stand anyone else washing my pans. Uh, so it's interesting. You wash your pans, but everything else goes in a dishwasher. Yeah, or or if somebody else takes care of it. Yeah. Yeah, but your pans stay out the dishwasher because they're the pans. Well, uh, that's correct. Sometimes I have to rescue them from a dishwasher, but <laughs> I take it these are more frying pans than just pots. Uh, just everything. Yeah, uh, uh, but mostly fry. Mostly, I mean, I, I have cast iron and and. Uh, and some stainless, some solid stainless steel ones. And I've never asked anyone this. How many frying pans do you have? Oh, uh, well, that I use three, I guess. No, oh, I beat you on that one. <laughs> I've definitely got more, <laughs> but it, it, it scales up. We, I, well, I have a lot. I have a lot, but I just don't use. Them. I got. I have a. I have a crepe pan. I, I just don't. I make crepes once a year, so I, I wouldn't say I use it. Yeah, I think I've probably got about seven. But there's, there's three or four hardcore ones that are used yeah. for, for, for very specific items or volume. Yeah, a big family, so it grows up. Yeah. Uh, tea or coffee? Oh, coffee. Wine or beer? Uh, wine. Chocolate or cheese? Well, I guess it depends on what... It depends on what <laughs> those are two... 
depends on which chocolate and which cheese, but I'll <laughs> say cheese. Okay, so you're a dark chocolate lover or a milk chocolate lover? No, more dark. More dark. And I didn't ask actually, what's your coffee choice? Is it Americano? Is it milky? Is it espressos? Uh, you've got a big mug there. So yeah, well, it's a, yeah, actually, I drink espresso, but if I drink espresso, I'd have like 50 of them because I'm kind of a volume guy. Um, so generally, generally, it's a watered down espresso. No, you should never water down an espresso. That well, is it's, a, it's just a very long. Let's just put it this way. It's a very long. <laughs> Fair enough. Early bird or night owl? Uh, I'm more of a night owl, but I, my job is more of an early bird job. Okay. And uh, what's your food, Heaven? What, what, what's your favorite food type? My favorite food type? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm Italian by, by genetics, so I'd say Italian. Okay. And what about your least favorite? If you, if you go to a conference or someone's take you out for dinner, when you, you're an invited speaker, they're taking you out for dinner and it's a set menu. What is your dread that they're going to put in front of you? Oh, uh, lima beans. God, that's a different one. Has that I ever know. happened? I, 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 like, I, like, I like all food. I pretty much like all food. Okay. Do you have any uh, bad habits? Um... Besides not communicating when you're getting on with you, <laughs> um, I, I mean, other than other than coffee and wine, probably not. Is that red or white wine, by the way? Sorry. Uh, yes, by all means. <laughs> Depends on what I'm having. You know, when I was when I was in Italy, I, I worked at the Synchrotron uh, in Italy when I was in graduate school, and uh, there they drink white wine in the summer and red wine in the winter. When it gets cold, they get switched to red wine. Okay. I thought that was that was sort of civilized, but um, I, I drink wine with food. So if I'm having something that's lighter, or uh, we we eat a lot of fish, so we drink more white wine. But, uh, okay. Do you have any pet hates? Things that really annoy you? Besides, uh, yeah, people stuff. touching my stuff. Oh, what sort? As in, on your desk at home or anywhere? They move it. They don't put it back right. <laughs> Oh, I know someone just like it's so so easy just to move so something on their car like move where they're. Well, you know my my um my shampoo is in the corner of the of the corner of the shower, and it's at a certain angle, so I can just reach over and pump it into my hand, and my wife cleans it and moves it. And it's like I pump it all over the floor. I, I mean, this time of year the sun's up, but in the winter I don't ever turn the lights on. I I go in and shave and shower without the lights on. It. I'm a spectroscopist, right? So <laughs> work in the dark. <laughs> I, I, you know, I worked in catastrophic darkness for for three years as a postdoc. So okay, I can empathise. Actually, just thinking about the shower, we've got different shampoos and shower gels or whatever. The two of us that are using it, and I, I like everything faced up in the right direction. Everything is a height order as well, so you can yeah. see everything. Yeah, faced up. It's turning to the wrong side. It's like, <sighs> yeah. I mean, I don't care what she does with hers. She can have it wherever she wants. But <clears throat> no, it, no, it can't just be plonked down anyway. It's got to be faced round. It's got to look. Neat, tidy. Well, I don't care how it looks. I just need to be able to hit it and have it go into my hand. <laughs> She's got like about a 10 degree, you know, like a 10 degree uh, tolerance error there that's possible still. <laughs> Book or TV? What's that? Book or TV? What? What's the TV? What, what do you prefer? Sorry, I'm still laughing. Oh. Yeah, what do you prefer? Book or TV? Oh, uh, well, I, 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 TV, I like to watch sports on TV, so. Uh, sometimes I'll read a book while I'm doing it. Okay. And I, I, I it, it, you sent me this one. So what's oh, yeah. Point? Well, this is because I'm in St. Louis, right? So that's the St. Louis Cardinals. We went to go see the, we go to see the a couple of Cardinals games every year. That's my wife and I at the Cardinals game. Was, we were, they were playing the San Francisco Giants, which was my hometown team growing up. So uh, we got good, we got good tickets for my birthday one year and uh, went there. And it get properly kitted out then. You got the top and the cap and. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's a uh, why not? I mean, it, it's a uh, it's this is a baseball town, right? So you you want to, you don't want to be the only person that shows up at the game without the right cap and shirt on. And what about your uh, when it comes to movies, films? What's your favorite film? Uh, my favorite. Well, my favorite film of all the time still uh, is still probably Star Wars. Although I'll tell people that it's it's. Um, either The Wizard of Oz or Spinal Tap. Why did you do that? Well, because, because I mean, those, I think those are the best films ever made. 
but my favorite film is still Star Wars because I just saw it at the time when I was I was like 15 and and it came out and it was like nothing we'd ever seen before and okay. you know I, so uh, it's probably the best reason I've heard why why you're not a Trekkie over Star. I presume you're a Star Wars fan over Star Trek then. Well, I liked I used to watch Star Trek. I mean, I, but to me, the Star Trek ended in 1969. There's no <laughs> other Star Trek. There's... Oh, Picard. Oh, Next Generation. What's that? Oh, just. Oh. We had Star Trek. Why do we need to. I, look, I just don't like. I mean, we had Star Trek. You can have another show, call it something else. <laughs> it's not Star Trek. Uh, that's, that's, I still love Picard. Uh, they had brought out Picard as well. About ah, uh, yes, a big fan of it. What about your favorite Christmas film? Uh, favorite Christmas film. Oh, uh, well, either I guess Charlie Brown or The Grinch. I mean, they're they're. Uh, I watch both of them every year, so I have both of them on on seat on uh, DVD. Okay. And I, I watch both of them. And is that a family thing? You watch it together? Uh, I make everyone watch it. Yes. You make everything watch it. Good grief. And we got family films and they're, they're, it's like, Dad, we're getting that close to Christmas. We've got to watch them now. We've got to watch them now. Uh, I've never, uh, it's a, uh, if Dad wants to watch it, nobody wants to watch it. Every once in a while, they discover something. Like uh, my younger daughter discovered uh, the song Killer Queen. And uh, <clears throat> so I got my old uh, LP out and played it for her. And then she stopped liking it. it almost, no, no, she still likes it. She still likes it. But it's like if I'd pointed that out to her, she would never have liked it. Yeah, it's a trick, isn't it? Make sure they make sure they think it's their decision that that's what they like. That's, yeah. that's a management skill. <clears throat> Get people to think it's their idea. It's and their then, idea, yeah. Uh, so moving off the the more light one, still talking about favorites though. Do you have a favorite publication that you've authored or co-authored for whatever reason? Oh. Or um, most memorable, favorite or most memorable. Well, I guess I mean, my favorite one is the Nature Methods GFP article we wrote with uh, Mike Davidson. I mean, Mike had passed away at the time when it came out, but uh, um, that has absolutely every, you know, it has every bleach, bleaching for every bleaching and, and um, expression and brightness for every GFP that was available at that time. Uh, and it's still, you know, it's, um, it just was a tour de force in so many ways, but it was all of the, was all done correctly, rigorously. The way it's hard hard to get when you see a new GFP come out and you look at their measurements. It's like I have no faith in them at all. And you can see you compare compare what we've had to the, what's was reported in the literature. And some some people are pretty good, and some people are really sloppy. Um, and it was done by you know four or five different people in two different labs, so it was really um, always. There was a ton of data um, and that was, I mean, there was, I still have all the data. It's on uh, 40, I think 42 terabyte disks, Ooh. box of them. Good grief. Uh, that's a lot of data, well, it's a lot for us and proteins, but that's yeah. a lot of data still. Yeah, well, it's got all the, it's got all the images, all the original images, all the photo bleaching in cells uh, with wide field and with spinning disk and with confoc with laser scanning confocal. And yeah, you talked about quantification and the importance of data, and actually, I, I, it's almost mind blowing because I, I, you know, I've looked at designing similar experiments in the past, but actually, it's fraught with challenges and difficulties and normalization and everything else. I've got to say, it's quite an achievement to have got around those problems yeah, and yeah. found a solution for it. It is not; it sounds and looks on paper so trivial. I, I, I don't mean to. No, no, I, I agree. I agree. It's uh, in fact, it's it's sort of straightforward in many ways, but it's but it's hard to get it's hard to get the details right. I know when when GFP first came out, um, you know, I said, oh, we, we first thing we got to do is measure the quantum efficiency and the brightness and extinction and photo bleaching and if photo there's a little bit of photo conversion in the in the original between the two states, and we wanted to see. They knew if they hit it with UV, they could make it more more blue absorbance. But we also discovered if you hit a blue, you could also make it more blue absorbent. And we wanted to get those two, the quantum yield of those two down. And we published this and everyone was like, oh, and I thought for sure everyone was gonna be doing this. <laughs> and everyone was like, oh, David, so I'm glad, so, so glad that you did this. So I thought everyone would be doing this. <laughs> but, uh, 
<laughs> so that's your favorite publication. What about your favorite favorite microscope technique? Do you have one? Oh, um, well, I guess, uh, I mean, to, I don't have one, but it's going to be some sort of light sheet. OK. Uh, I mean, light sheet is really light the winning technique. Just light, okay. Yeah, light sheet's the winning technology, right? Because it gives you all the advantages in terms of low excitation um, intensities. So it lowers photo bleaching and it's more gentle uh, with the advantages of, of, of um, you know, 3D spatial, spatial discrimination. So, so uh, from, yeah. from the light to the more lighthearted questions, what have you had? <sighs> What's been the best time of your career? Oh, postdoc, no doubt. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, um, I was in Watt Webb's lab. We, were, we had a ton of resources. Uh, two Photon had just been invented. I was probably the only person in the world working on it because Winfred Dank had gone off to, uh, uh, at IBM and was working on near field scanning with Diamond. Uh, and um, so we were doing this and people, smart biologists were coming up and collaborating with us. and. And um, yeah, I just went into, the, went into the lab at 10 in the morning and turned the laser on and worked till late at night, and turned the laser off, went home and ate dinner. And uh, some people, sometimes there'd be people there doing experiments with me and sometimes I was doing them myself. And how, how did you find cope? Because obviously the sampling types would be quite varied on the multiphoton. How did you cope with the varying biology and the, the way the samples were being presented? How did you, how did you adapt to that as a physicist at that point? Well, I mean, uh, you know, so there weren't very many things we could do, right? We didn't have Thai Sapphire yet, so we really were stuck, and GFP hadn't been invented, hadn't been cloned yet. So we were really stuck with calcium indicators. Uh, we were doing a lot of NADH and FAD autofluorescence. So um, obviously doing NADH was one of the big things that we did and, and sort of pioneered, and the Webb's lab went on to use that a lot uh, with some of the people in his lab on neuro stuff and we've used we used it a lot on islets and and muscle we still use that as a as a as a uh, sort of a standard standard technique in my lab uh and and flavin so we used a lot of we were using a lot of autofluorescence um and so basically you know people if they wanted live cells they needed to come make them themselves so john letterer who is, works on cardiac myocytes came up with a postdoc and they uh, this was in a day and age before uh, IACUX existed. So they just ordered, they ordered animals and maybe brought them up with them or, or ordered them and picked them up at, uh, at Cornell and uh, took the hearts out and isolated the cardiac myocytes right there. And we had them on the stage and we just, we just worked uh, all night till we were tired and then got up early in the next morning, went to breakfast and came in and worked again. <coughs> and, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I went home and I, then I came back and analyzed data in the morning while things were warming up and that was it. There was no paperwork. There was no, every once in a while you went to a meeting and you had to fill out your travel form, but it was three years of really nothing but writing paper, you know, taking data, analyzing data and writing papers. Yeah. So the singular, singular focus, I guess, back then. <laughs> yeah, the, other thing is, the other thing is, well, the postdoc, well, I had like four or five different projects, but they didn't have to be related as a graduate student. You can't work on something that's not going to go in your thesis. Well, I guess you can, but it doesn't help you that much. Right? Yeah. So, as I always said, I, I, I called it graduate school for a reason, because I wanted to graduate. <laughs> so they're the best times. What's been the most difficult time you've had to face? Uh, well, I mean, not that, I, you know, uh, switching, switching, from, switching from physics to biology and having never been in a lab that had an R01 which is the main NIH funding mechanism here, um, was really quite difficult, although I had a lot of support from my department. Uh, we were publishing some papers, and, and obviously Two Photon was very high profile, uh, but it was hard to get grants uh, until we got some biological results, right? So um, I guess in hindsight, I look back and think that should have been a lot more stressful than it was. But I was I was working all I was working as hard as I could and 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 uh, as it turns out probably doing the right thing. Uh, I mean obviously I think COVID was just really hard mentally on everybody. Um, and you know it was com compacted with the American political situation at the time, which was stressing out my family a lot as well. And... Yeah, different stress though. 
maybe compared to the other environments. I've got a question now, which is going to lead to the next one. What's your favorite conference? My favorite, well, I go to uh, Biophysical Society is my, that's my, the first conference I went to as a graduate student. Uh, that was in 1986. Oh, there's the president. Yeah, so this is, uh, so TJ Ha, who's back in the back next to me, is, gonna, is the incoming president. Gail Robertson is in the front uh, right uh, with curly white hair is the president now. And Kathy Royer was president before me. And, uh, and Francis Saperovich was right above you, who was president after me. Sue Scarlata was before, maybe two before Kathy. And Lucas Tam was either in between or they were the last two or, yeah, so that was that's uh, yeah seven biophysical society presidents in a row there. What's the importance of that society for you? What role does it play that is so vital? Well, I think uh, I think you know um, for me biophysics for me biophysics was where I learned that's where I met biologists, uh, where I met biologists who wanted to be quantitative, where I met biologists who had samples that would be useful to use with the latest and greatest techniques. So it's a, it's a conference that brings a lot of people that are tool builders, like I was at the time when I was uh, in, in graduate school or postdoc, uh, with people that are real, um, you know, high-end power users of the, of the techniques, uh, the sort of more quantitative bent biologists. Um, obviously, electrophysiology is really big there, and so a lot of stuff that, that is um, single molecule sort of grew up in that, in that society. Um, and so I think that's for me now, for me, I go there and I see the latest and greatest tools that people are building and think about what we can use on our, in our, uh, experiments. So I, I become more of a, maybe more of a power user of, uh, of, of technology than a developer. And of course, I guess it enables you to travel as well. As you said, I think you said earlier that travel was. Well, yeah, but I mean, go, go in the biophysics meeting, of course. This last meeting I went to, in fact, this meeting, this is in San Francisco this year uh, in 2022. It was our first meeting back uh, in, in two years. And, um, you know, that was the first meeting I had been, a, that I was a civilian in forever. So I joined the editorial board of Biophysical Journal around 2000, probably, and was involved in different things from that time on. Uh, so for about 20 years, I was always busy at, it's culminating in being president in 2019. If you're president at the meeting, you, you show up on Friday and you leave on Thursday and in between your schedule is full. So uh, you don't see a lot of things. And so uh, it was nice to be able to go see talks and to, to make notes about a poster I wanted to go see and then actually go and see the poster and talk to the people. And then the importance of it being in person? Oh, I think that was, uh, it, yeah, I think absolutely critical. I think uh, it's all it's all the hallway conversations. Uh, you know, I want to. The other thing I do at the meeting is recruit people. Like most of my good postdocs have come from that meeting. Uh, I don't know most, but um, certainly a lot of them have come from that meeting. Uh, you know, you see people that are, you see people doing things that you are interested in, and just ask if they're what they're doing next, or if they're a student. And then you see their you see their uh, PhD advisor around the corner, and you get a instant uh, recommendation. Uh, and then you you invite them to dinner, and uh, you can just casually talk to the person to see if it's the kind of person that you want to have in your lab. Inter introduce them to some of the people in your lab. Have the people from your lab go by. Now you're going to ask me to edit that out because now everyone's going to want to be asked to to go for dinner with you at the next BPS meeting. That's okay. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> and. You did send me a couple of other pictures. We're really close to running out of time. So, do you want to describe what we can see? Oh yeah. So this is so this is the this is really what I do in my spare time. So uh, I I was um, I used to sing quite a bit. I mean, I still sing a little bit, but after I after I turned fifty, my voice wasn't quite in the shape it was. This is Nick McGeegan, who's uh, a famous conductor. He's sort of a Mendelssohn scholar, uh, but does a lot of oratorios. And I sang the Messiah with him a couple of times. This was him at the St. Louis Symphony. He was uh, I don't remember what he'd done that night, um, what he had done that night, but we had a reception afterwards for him. I'm involved in the board of the St. Louis Symphony, and so we had a reception for him. And so uh, he's my favorite conductor I've ever sang with. Uh, we did, like I said, we did the Messiah with him. And he's, he said one of, the, one of my favorite lines a conductor had ever said is there's a, there's a line in the Messiah, which is, 
even so in Christ shall all be made alive. He said that's the most important V in all of choral literature. Because otherwise you say, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. And uh, as, a, as a singer, you know, working a lot with uh, making sure your diction is right, I thought that was very... That's quite a good one. A very clever thing. I really liked, I really liked I did, that. So I didn't so. know about the singing until just so I'm glad I brought this picture up. Yeah. So the next one. Yeah, so this is, this is uh, Sulu. This is my Star Trek. And this is George Takai. And uh, this was, I was actually singing with the Nashville Symphony at the time, and we did a, um, a Schoenberg piece, uh, um, Survivor, uh, Survivor of the Ghetto of Warsaw. And George was the narrator of that. And uh, this is an amazingly powerful piece. It was written by uh, uh, a man who hid underground and they drug off, they killed everybody and he was left behind and, and survived. Uh, and he heard, he heard all of uh, Jewish men as they were being killed sing the, sing the Jewish song. And, uh, and so that's what it's about. And George was the narrator and his family was, had been um, held in the, uh, uh, Japanese internment camps in the World War II uh, that the Americans had set up. And so it was really, a, it was a great emotional uh, night, but uh, it was a, a, I wouldn't say a fun piece to sing, but a very challenging piece and uh, something that, you know, never, it's the kind of thing you never, you, you can have a recording of it. It will never have the power of a, of a live performance of it. And so yeah, I sang, sang with the Nashville Symphony Chorus for 23 years when I was at Vanderbilt. And I sang, I sang professionally when I was in uh, graduate school, uh, mainly singing commercial jingles uh, because I didn't get paid very much as a graduate student. And uh, not that there's anything I want to remember to say. I was about to say, you've got to give us a jingle now. No, no, no. I'm not going to. It was one that some of the words were, we're number one in the number two business. And that's about all you need to know about it. <laughs> oh, no, I'm so intrigued now. I should have asked this earlier because I could have kept coming back to this to try and get a jingle off you all the way through little jingles that would have been really cool i've, I've wiped all those from my memory most of them were pretty darn bad I just, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah quite oh, no, let's not go there and i guess these are oh that's maine that's my uh, that's the cottage i stayed in in maine for 20 years when i was teaching the course up in maine so this is to remind me about teaching my cross that's what the fish <clears throat> picture is that's the cottage at Mount island like biological lab um mm -hmm. I, uh, every day, every year I was there, I took a picture like this. And um, I think most years there was one day that was nice enough weather to take a picture like this. Oh, it was, so it's not always like that then. No, 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 not really. There was one year where it was horizontal rain all year. And this is, that's the sunset at the same place. That's uh, at MDI on the same day because you've got a nice day <laughs> once over. So finally, we are up to the hour and I can't believe we're up to the hour. And we talked about the important societies. Go on. What's the next big step for your research? Or can you not say about that? Oh, well, I mean, you know, we, uh, so um, really we found these, we found uh, several pathways that influence the alpha cell uh, glu glucagon secretion. So insulin is the hormone that everyone knows about that comes from the pancreatic islet, but glucagon is the counter regulatory hormone, uh, which when insulin goes up, glucagon goes down. And importantly, when insulin uh, when insulin goes down and there's uh, low glucose, glucagon goes up to tell the liver and, and uh, to make more glucose and tells your body to release it and stop taking it up. And uh, in the presence of insulin, glucagon isn't so important. It's more of a fine tuner. But in the absence of insulin, either in type 1 diabetes when the beta cells are killed or in type 2 when insulin just fails, it turns out that glucagon is, plays a very important role. And what happens is instead of it going down when it's supposed to, it goes up and it, it makes things worse. So we've been working on that on pathways. It's not understood exactly what regulates it normally or, or even in diabetes, but we have some pathways that we think can regulate it, whether they're the ones that normally regulate it or not, uh, that can regulate it in diabetic situations. And so we're trying to screen for drugs that will hit those pathways. Um, I would really like to know how an alpha cell works, but uh, people have been working on that for 45 years now, and I don't think that we're any closer than we were 45 years ago. So uh, I, I don't like to set goals that I'm probably not gonna reach, but I think we can actually have some potential drug targets that uh, would be worth exploring um, for tr treatment of, especially of type one diabetes. Um, you know, at, at type two diabetes, I know how to treat, uh, just get some exercise. 
Uh, a lot of people get obese and don't get type, type 2 diabetes. And those tend to be, you can be very obese if you're still moving a lot. Uh, you're probably not so prone to getting uh, diabetes. So it's a disease not only of, of high caloric intake, whether it's obesity or sugar, or, but it's also a, a, a sedentary component. And unfortunately, but that's why we need more in-person conferences because you, you're not sedentary at in-person conferences as much as you are at the Zoom conferences. I, I, I was about to ask, what is your exercise then to keep yourself fit, to keep yourself lean? Well, I mean, um, yeah, it's uh, no elevators. So uh, I take the stairs a lot. I, I walk pretty fast. Uh, I, I ride uh, I ride my bike if I can. I mostly ride my exercise bike though. Uh, I watch watch uh, in the fall. I watch football and ride my exercise bike for for uh, I, I watch uh, basically what for about an hour to an hour and a half. Um, try to put twenty miles on the exercise bike uh, <laughs> while I'm watching football. Because I was like like I said I I can I can I like to watch football but. Uh, and World World Cup's always good for that, right? When you're watching the World Cup, I mean, you have to be doing something else if you're watching soccer. Right? Yeah, yeah, drinking beer. Well, no. you can do that too. But you can drink beer for half the game and ride the, ride the exercise bike for the first half, and then, and then drink, drink beer for the second half. Undo all the good stuff on the second half of it. Dave, we have to call it a day because it is up to the hour now. Thank okay. you so much for joining me today, everyone. If you've enjoyed watching and listening, please don't forget to subscribe. Go back. There's loads of tips and tricks in the previous episodes that Dave's actually alluded to throughout this. Dave, you've been really great to talk to, some really great, I think that last bit uh, and where you're going to, how you've moved all your physics knowledge through to actually now and going into diabetes research, I think I think is quite good and a really great case for many watching to essentially follow your passion, follow where, where, follow where you can succeed and what you're interested in. Yeah, I just say be a scientist, not a physicist or a chemist or a biologist. Just be a scientist. Oh, lovely phrase. On that note, Dave, thank you very much. All right. Bye bye. Thank you for listening to The Microscopists, a bite sized bio podcast sponsored by Zeiss Microscopy. To view all audio and video recordings from this series, please visit bitesizebio.com forward slash the microscopists.